people come speak to us, but none more outstanding than Matt Eyring, who you will hear from in a moment. Uh, I'm thrilled to be able to introduce him to you. Uh, a number of you may, may know of his reputation already, which uh, is uh, considerable. Matt uh, grew up uh, here in uh, uh, Utah, graduated from the University of Utah, uh, went to Harvard, got an MBA, uh, started with a little company called Lava Storm uh, back there, had a variety of different experiences prior to uh, going to HBS for his graduate degree. Uh, and then when Clayton Christensen started his new consulting firm called Innocite to deal with uh, issues having to do with disruptive technologies around which Clayton was rapidly developing a worldwide reputation as a professor at Harvard Business School, he asked uh, Matt to help him organize the company and to be a co-founder of that firm. I had been acquainted with Matt's older brother, Henry uh, Iring, and uh, Henry suggested that Matt give me a call, and we had a wonderful conversation about how do you organize a professional service firm. I was at the time running my own company called the Center for Executive Development, uh, and I can tell you that it was clear to me from that conversation that Matt was a great listener and would be a great partner for Clayton Christensen, and indeed that has been the case. Innocent has gone on to some wonderful success since then, and Matt Eyring was very, very much a part of that success. Uh, the ideas that they uh, made famous in the world, and I really say made famous in the world because you cannot go to a business conference any place in the world today without hearing the world word disruption or disruptive technology. The ideas that they made famous and worked with are some of the most important ideas of our time. Uh, Clayton Christensen has uh, been recognized in the last several years as being the number one, uh, I'm going to use a term that may not be totally respectful, but business guru in the world. Uh, and. Uh, the work that Innocite has done has been some of the most important work that uh, has been done by consulting organizations in the world. We're very fortunate in Utah to have Matt Eyring back here with us. Uh, just, was it six months, eight months ago? January 3rd. January 3rd even, okay. Uh, he accepted a new position as the Chief Strategy and Chief Innovation Officer of Vivint Corporation, a very rapidly growing company who uh, just raised $2 billion in capital uh, uh, in Provo. And it, it's rapidly growing in many, many different directions, and I'll let him talk about it, but one of the things that you all should be interested in is the fact that they actually hire people who are really, really smart. So since you are the ones who are smart enough to figure out that this is a place you should be for this hour, uh, you are all candidates for potential jobs at, uh, at Vivint. We'll let them decide which ones of you shall be the lucky few. But will you join me in welcoming Matt Allen? Intellectually and as a, 
as a business person, who, who do I need to call to figure out how to do this? And he said, Doug Anderson is the only guy you need to talk to. He's somebody that uh, regularly deals with Fortune 500 companies and their senior leadership and C-level executives who can advise writing case studies and, and <coughs> starting a very, very successful company. And, uh, and so that was a, a huge a blessing to us as we started with just two of us. We had some, uh, we had, had some other debts we needed to pay back and some challenges we needed to hire people, uh, not just free interns for the summer to, to make a go of it, and build a brand, and he was very, very helpful uh, for an hour or so giving advice on, on how, that, uh, how that can happen or could happen in a very, very great way. So let me ask at the start here, I think we've got, uh, See if I can see that clock. I think we've got about an hour together at this point. Uh, and let me just get a pulse on who is sitting here in the audience. So how many of you uh, are undergraduates uh, here at Huntsman? So we've got, and those of you who will be graduating, those are undergraduates, they'll be graduating within a, a year or two, most of you here. Yeah, okay. Any MBAs that we have here in the program? Fantastic. So let me, let me start out talking a bit. I know they, they asked me to do Q&A at the end, but I just encourage you uh, to ask whatever questions you want to, especially at the start. I thought I'd put something on your mind at the start of this, which is talk a little bit about my career trajectory, and, and more importantly, yours, which is how you think about it as you uh, prepare to graduate and get your first job, and you're not going to be able to predict exactly where you're going to end up, but how do you manage that process? So that's... That's number one. We'll talk about that for a few moments, and I'll take any questions that you have uh, about anything that I've done. Uh, Vivint, Innocite, uh, Business School, for those of you who are thinking about it, and, I, and any other question you have, I would say any uh, life question of that nature. And then I thought for the, the second part, I would talk about how you build businesses from my point of view. So. Uh, me and Anderson talked a little bit about the business I was in, which was really helping <clears throat> Fortune 100, those are the kind of clients that can afford to pay the bills of consultants uh, at, at that kind of level, but trying to, uh, to help those companies, and really we worked with about a third of the Fortune 50 at Insight over time, helping C-level executives and their uh, direct reports create organic growth, which is a huge issue, start new businesses within established corporations. So that's something that I've dedicated a decade of my life to, something that I'm doing here now again in Utah with Vivint. And uh, I, I've also been involved in, in smaller startups outside of Intersight and Vivint. I've had some success and I've had some failure, and I, I can talk to you about that for those of you who are hoping to live the entrepreneurial life. So, so those are the two things I thought we talked about today. Let me, let me speak first about um, career strategy. And, and I caveat this with, uh, I have no more authority than my own life and the lives of a lot of young people that I've seen, but I have worked in organizations where I'm hiring a lot. You know, at Intersight, we were hiring undergrads all the time and then uh, working with them as their careers progressed, and I, I came through that track myself. Uh, let me give you just a little bit of, uh, of background uh, to set this up, which is, this is the most conservative uh, number I'll put up here, but during the course of your, of your career, you're going to have a lot of job changes. And I, I read something last night that came in over a, a LinkedIn connection that just said, you know, you're going to be changing every, I don't know what it said, 2.3 years. I think that might be a little bit aggressive. If you're changing that often, uh, it, it, it might be, throughout your career, it might be a sign that you're, you're not getting as much done as you, you ought to be. Uh, but the point was, there will be many, many changes over the career, and I, I think it was saying a, a dozen, more than a dozen. I would say even conservatively, from those, I, I attended the Harvard Business School, and I watched those who have even stayed in as few jobs as, as the cohort that I've seen, from the cohort I've seen, and I, I'd say that you're going to be moving around quite a bit. Uh, and we'll talk about some of the reasons for that. Uh, the world is changing in, in various ways that, uh, that make that happen more often, but, but it's not going to be the 30-year-old for sure that your parents' world your parents lived in. 
uh, where you went to a corporation, you grew up within that corporation. Uh, you know, from the time of Alfred Sloan, we've created these pyramids and this organizational structure to manage complexity, and we move up within that within that pyramid over time. And we have benefits at the end of our time to those companies uh, that uh, that can outlive us or, or live with us through the end of our lives. So the world is is completely changed from that standpoint. And then I think partly from my industry and partly from the millennial generation that there's a restlessness that's going to cause you to move around. Let me give sort of the three uh, guideposts that I've used as I've managed my career the best I could to, uh, to, achieve, uh, to achieve what success uh, hopefully that I, I've uh, seen and, and that you might see. So there are, there are three elements that I've tried to keep in mind when thinking about happiness and career. One of them is confidence, which is, what am I really, really good at? And you'll learn that over time. Those of you who watch you know, talent contests and American Idol will see there's a disconnect sometimes between uh, the perception of what somebody enjoys doing and what they are confident in doing. And so for, for you, you'll really want to first take a look at what is it that I'm great at doing? What are, if, you, if you stack up the cohort around me, and, and not just at this school, and not just at the local schools, but across the country. What am I, if you had to stack up everyone, what, is, what, is, what are things that I'm very, very good at? Secondly, as I put up, what are things that I enjoy doing? Uh, it, it's a bit of a, an overused statement that you should do something you love to do. But that's pretty important because it's, it's very far with the experience curve to get good at things you don't spend a lot of time at. And if you don't spend, if you're not spending a lot of, of time and you don't enjoy it, if you don't enjoy it, you're not going to spend a lot of time thinking about it. In the moments, you don't have to be thinking about anything. So uh, another, another of, of the big idols in my life was my grandfather, who was a scientist. And, and, uh, and he used to say, as, as only someone who's a, uh, a, a theoretical chemist could say, your, uh, your output is going to be the the integral of your ability integrated over your hours of effort. So some of you will appreciate that statement, right? So it, it's going to be your capability integrated over the amount of time that you're going to spend. And if you'd rather be off riding four-wheel vehicles in the mountains or doing some other leisure thing, when you're in the shower, you'd rather be thinking about anything else but the topic, you're, you're unlikely to, to be really good at it uh, or get better at it over time. So those two things are, are linked. The third is things that are, are um, in high demand in the world, sort of on the supply demand curve. And I, I look at this as, as not a value statement. As I look around, and I, I remember once Warren Buffett came to the Harvard Business School, and he just said, I was just, I was just lucky. There's some lottery. And had I been born 200 years earlier, I would have been a terrible farmer. I, I possess no great physical attributes. He said, I just happened to be born at a time when my skill set, which is uh, investing and being able to look at markets and industries and companies um, in an astute way, is, is highly valuable. There's something in those supply and demand curves uh, such that what I am really good at and what I enjoy is in high demand. And when you, uh, when you, when you hit this nexus, for me, that is when your career is going to produce a lot of uh, happiness for you. This is apart from other things. There's a, there's a great book by Clay Christensen called How Would You Measure Your Life. If you haven't read it, um, I, don't, I don't get any money for recommending Clay Christensen's <laughs> books. Um, and, but, but I would read that book before you leave school. I really would. Uh, he's, a smart, he's a smart guy, and he talks about this career process. And he also talks about resource allocation. Uh, there's a, resource allocation is a topic that the academics in the audience are, are tuned to and really interested in, at least some of them. But he applied the resource allocation process that companies use. Where do we put our money? What bets do we make? Where do we allocate our time? He applied that to life. And you really ought to look at that. And uh, the point is that even if you have these things, there are other priorities that you should stacking first in your life, probably, if you, want, if you want to be happy. But as far as a career goes, when you're good at something, you love doing it, and the world demands it, 
in my mind, uh, you're in a, a great place. So I just, that, that's my cobbled together view of, of careers. Uh, and and it's, it's guided me a bit, and I'll make another point. There's this word emergent strategy. So the academics also talk a bit about delivered strategy and emergent strategy. And your life is going to be a bit of an emergent strategy. I don't, you know, let me just give you examples of that. It's in the people that you meet and will re meet over time. The, the world of important and powerful people is a pretty small world, and you'll meet people and then meet them again in other contexts. An example of that is just this phone call that I had 10 years ago, and in fact, I'm standing here. So you will, you will meet people and see opportunities. And you'll have to make trade-offs. There will be some sub-optimization within those three things at any given time. Uh, and that's part of this emergent strategy, which is you'll go to some place where you may not exactly in, in, enjoy it, but you're great at it, and you're getting the contacts and skills that you need. You may decide to do something and scare your, your in-laws um, or others close to you terribly by choosing something that you're good at and love, but no one will pay any money for it. Uh, good luck. And, uh, you know, you, you may choose to be a creative in some field where, you know, you're, you just say, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stake out my ground, and I know that only one or two people get really paid well to do this, and I'm going to try to be one of those one or two people. So, but you'll be moving from point to point, optimizing those those elements the best you can, hopefully getting close toward the end of, you know, I'm on sort of a 20-year plus odyssey for the seats here, and I'll talk about that in just a second, and then we'll take any questions. Where you get to something where you're like, this is, this is perfect, or I'm perfect. And I, I feel at least in my career doing what I'm doing, I'll talk about that in a second, but I, I'm, I'm closer to that point now. Um, so, I was sitting in a seat like yours as a junior when my brother Henry asked if I wanted to come or apply for a job as a management consultant in Boston, Massachusetts. I'd never been to Boston and I had no clue what management consulting was. And that was the start of, uh, of getting a job in Boston uh, at Monitor Company. Uh, I, I showed up, I, I didn't know anything about anything. I, my, my office mate was from McGill. I had no idea where McGill was in Canada. I, another was from Smith. I had no idea where Smith College was. I had never met anyone from Yale or Harvard or any of these other places. But that was the start of, of trying to uh, get some skills and, and begin to play on the field with, uh, with the top in, in business analytics and business consulting. And that led me on, on a journey to get a full-time job offer. I skipped graduation. <coughs> which I shouldn't have done, I don't recommend. Uh, I did receive something in the mail, but I never walked out because I thought I'm gonna get out to my job early and in May and get ahead of everyone else. I don't know what I was thinking. Uh, I'm show up to your graduation. And uh, thank you for that. Yes, please do, endorsed by the dean. And then, uh, and then I, I, I slaved, I don't wanna say slave, but I worked 80 to 100 hour weeks for a while. In that cohort was uh, Matt Holland, who was the uh, president of, uh, of UVU. Uh, and uh, he was one of the only ones from, from Utah and a bunch of other people. I went to South America, and that was one of the loves I had. So I knew I had served a, a Mormon mission in Chile. I loved the chaotic environment there. And Michael Porter, who is uh, Harvard University professor now was at the Harvard Business School at that time and found a co-founded monitor. If you ever come across the five forces still, I don't know if they, they teach it, they have abandoned it. It's, it's, it's really taking microeconomic theory and sticking in boxes, so don't, don't let your hair be blown back too much. But uh, uh, he had written a book called The Competitive Advantage of Nations, which if you tell me you're right, I'll tell you you're liars because it is so long and, uh, and the dean's read it. And I, yeah. <laughs> He does all sorts of macroeconomic and, and microeconomic analysis. The, the theory of the book in one sentence is that firms compete uh, not, or industries compete, not nations, and industries are 
are, are made up, obviously, of, of the firms within those industries. And so it was a theory of microeconomic competitiveness for macroeconomic prosperity. Now, there's a lot below that, but, but that's the idea. And I, I went, somebody in the hall said, hey, we're, we've got a job in Bogota, Colombia. Um, it's very dangerous. They took out a picture, actually, and showed Pablo Escobar had blown up the hotel the week before. And, uh, and they showed me this picture. I was sitting at the gallery eating lunch, and they said, does this kind of stuff bother you? I said, absolutely not. It's fantastic. You get on the next plane to Bogota, and you're going to be on this project where, uh, where I studied the cut flower industry as one of the, I was in charge of the cut flower analysis, and I did a cost analysis of the cost of a grower, landed cost in the U.S. in Miami and then out through the distribution wholesaling and, and retail and distribution network for a strategy of how those uh, flower growers would forward integrate and uh, get closer to the customer. And that was the start of, of getting back to the, to the developing world. They, uh, they then assigned me to, uh, to run our work in Bolivia. The president there was named uh, Sanchez de Rosada. He was a president, two-term president. They changed presidents a lot, so it's easy to and a couple of times. He was from Chicago. He spoke Spanish uh, a little better than I did, but not much. He came back. His father was exiled, he lived in Chicago until he was about 20. And I learned uh, about working at a higher level with a little bit with that president and then with his cabinet members and then the top industrialists of that country trying to pull together a vision of, uh, of prosperity and competitiveness, raising GDP per capita. Uh, and that again sort of fired up. I said, you know, I think I'm good at putting teams together and getting on the ground in chaotic environments. And I love the work with products. And we were in Santa Cruz, Bolivia, where the door manufacturers, how do you think about getting a, a product development strategy together and, and attacking the US market? So I and, and it was in the, it was in demand. It was I think it was combat pay, but they were starting to pay me a little bit better. From there, I applied to the Harvard Business School. I thought that uh, I could live my whole life in South America. I told my wife, I, th I think we should just set up shop here. And, and we were gone within two weeks after I made that statement. And, uh, <laughs> and I applied to the Harvard Business School and got in. And then from there, I took a few courses uh, in healthcare while I was there. Reggie Gerslinger was a well-known professor in the healthcare debate. I thought, well, this is a screwed up industry that hurts a lot of people. And uh, I had a... Um, <laughs> I hate to say it, but uh, you know we, we've got issues, don't we? And I thought, you know, I'd like to do a little bit in the world. And uh, a, a CFO from a company called Medtronic in Minneapolis came, Bob Ryan, absolute amazing individual. And right there on the spot, I went to one of these student meetings like this, and I went down and I, I, I said, "This is the place I want to work." And so I got into that uh, for a few years. The internet surface was was starting to heat up around 2000. Uh, you guys weren't there for that, but it was it was an interesting and, and hot time. A lot of people going out to start companies. You're seeing all these stock prices ending with the dot com uh, going crazy. And I had some people approach me uh, from an internship I had done at Harvard and said, "Hey, do you want to form an internet professional services firm?" That was Lava Storm, which the dean mentioned. There, I learned a little bit about technical management and about. Uh, Programming, computer science, and management of technology. We worked on some interesting projects. Family Search uh, for the Mormon Church was, was one of them back then. Uh, we worked on some of the largest and most uh, scalable systems, the largest traffic in the world for a while. As the internet bubble uh, burst, Clay Christensen gave me a call and said, Hey, Matt, would you mind coming helping me for a couple hours a week? You know, I've got this uh, company. Um, movies in, in uh, I think it was, or, or someone on, on, uh, in New York City, and I need you to go in and facilitate some sessions. And I went and did that, and then worked my way into a consulting company that uh, then I had ownership of and began to build. So I tell you, tell you all of that, not, I, I, I don't think I've ever given a talk where I've related that. I, I, I don't do that for me, I do that for you, just so you can see. Uh, in these circles that I think produce optimum, optimum real, happiness or utility or actualization in your career, uh, you're, you'll need to be, you'll have an emergent strategy, but you'll get to know the right set of people, have the right set of opportunities, and you'll begin to move between those so that you can optimize your career. 
Vivint, by the way, just to end up, and I'll take a few questions on career and then talk about building a business. Vivint was something, if you would have told me a year ago that I'd be back in Utah, Amy, my wife Amy asked, asked me a year ago, uh, you know, will we ever move from Boston? I said, no, I think we'll, we'll probably end up here, we'll die here. I mean, we're in Massachusetts, folks, the kids are cheering for the Red Sox and the Patriots and the Bruins and, and uh, the Celtics, and we've got a great business. And, but Blackstone bought Vivint here locally, and I, I think that, having kept in touch with a lot of the people from previous in the career, and this is a theme, I met a few of the top computer science folks. Jeremy Warren had gone to the Department of Justice as the Chief Technology Officer, and then had gone and joined 2Gig, which worked with Vivint, and then was joining Vivint. JT Wong was there, a lot of other people I respected, Alex Dunn, who was the Chief of Staff uh, with Governor Romney, and then Blackstone bought it, and then I knew that that there was this Internet of Things that was what I thought was the next big industry opportunity. Sensors and everything. So your, your, your cell phone, door and, door and window sensors that you use in a security sense, uh, you know, embedded sensors for healthcare. I worked with those in Medtronic. All those sensors were going to provide data and a cloud and intelligence back to us in a way that I thought, hey, this is going to be a hot industry. It's not just going to be a security and home automation. The world is going to move more to this Internet of Things. I'd seen clients uh, poking at it in different directions, to telemedicine and other things. And I thought, boy, Vivint is a great platform. Uh, Blackstone just provided the capital and the leadership to ask me, hey, can you use some of these ideas and theories that you came up with at Insight with Clay and Harvard and these other folks to help build businesses and see if you can create work with your living. And that was enough, again, that that uh, we made that leap and came back here. So, so that's uh, that's a little bit. Any questions that any of you have as you're looking out in your own careers? And, and you may not. There's no grand plan. Anybody who tells you that they have a grand plan in their life is a liar. Um, I mean, there's some. I mean, you, there's some who probably played the piano from four and kind of knew they'd always they'd be a concert pianist. But I tell you, most of the folks, if you sat and talked with the senior faculty and administrators here at the Dean would probably tell you it's, it's a little more of an emergent process trying to optimize between the important things in your life. Any, I know that's a little bit high level and I haven't gotten off too far. Ask any question. Yes? Compass test is straight too far from the top of the button. Then we're going to have to, for the posterity, I'll we'll repeat the question into the mic. Okay. Tell, tell me your name. My name is Benjamin. Benjamin? And I'm just wondering about how your work life balance has changed. You mentioned that you were 80 to 100 hours a week uh, yeah. when, when you first started out in that consulting group. How has that changed throughout your career? And have you found enjoyment in working long hours and, and staying competent? Benjamin, you like difficult questions, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so do you want the truth or do you want just an answer? I, I want the truth personally. I can't speak for everyone. Okay. So uh, that is a that's a difficult matter you'll probably be struggling with for, for some time, all the way up to, to the end of your career, to some, to some extent. Uh, let me tell you what I think are a few truths. One is that the world is an incredibly competitive place. And if you want to be the best at something, if you want to be the, the best uh, finance professor, or trader, or product development person in this world. Uh, you're going to have people who, who are very smart in that equation at the start that I said it's, it's ability integrated over the hours of, of effort. Uh, and and you'll be, you'll, you will be, to be the best at something in the world, which I think you should aspire to, I think there's something there's something great, um, you know, you won't think this way, you know, you're just here, you, you haven't been out yet, but life is short, and you shouldn't waste it on uh, not trying to impact the world and other people in a positive way. And to do that, you're going to have to give extraordinary effort, no matter how smart or how good you are. Because the world is full of, it's a very, very competitive uh, place, and there's no shortcuts 
you know, I, I see these people inventing business models that are kind of, uh, they've got they've got shortcuts in them. They've, they've got a, a really powerful sales or distribution engine that works the product or, you know, and they're just, if you're going to get out and really provide value to customers and shareholders and really succeed in any field, uh, you're going to have to give yourself entirely to it for a long period of time. That being said, it will ebb and flow depending on where you where you are in the in the cycle a bit. Early in your career, you'll be working longer hours probably than you will be at the end. Mostly just because you won't be managing a lot of people that will be providing leverage for you. Uh, you know, when, when somebody wants the presentation in the deck, you'll be delivering a lot of those things on deadline if you're a services business like I was, versus assigning those out. And that might mean that you're going to see the sun rise uh, or set and rise in your office a couple times. And that's not a bad thing. I don't. Uh, I don't think anybody that puts a dent in the universe is not giving that kind of effort. Uh, the, way, the, the, the only other comment that I would make is, uh, and I got this from a cardiac surgeon that I respect a lot. I got from the cardiac surgeons as well at Medtronic. They start early and the life is really hard. And this person uh, had, was a cardiac surgeon, an eminent cardiac surgeon, had a lot of kids, and I asked them, how do you manage it? He said, it's like an airplane. I, uh, when one of the one of the wings is unbalanced, I put bricks on the other side, and I, you know, whether that's for you, family, and other big priorities in your life, you're going to be unbalanced for some part of it, but you're going to be always cautious that uh, you don't get a permanent state like that, so that your higher priorities aren't compromised. And really, th this is important. But if you read Play's book and 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 talk to to, to other people that have been balanced, quote unquote, and, and successful in their lives, i.e. their their personal lives are, are uh, and things that matter most to them outside of work are in good shape, they'll, they'll think like that, in my opinion, and I've, I've asked around a bit. That's a great question, uh, important question. Yes, well, tell us your name. I'm Gary Maxfield. Maxfield? Um, you may have figured this out. Share one, one of your failures. Yeah, so uh, uh, why do people work at big companies? That's an interesting question. Uh, I, I'm somewhat tainted too. I, I went to the University of Utah economics program where, where Marxist uh, thought was still, still being taught. But, uh, <laughs> But but you but big corporations employ folks because they are uh, they're safe. I I'm dreading the moment when my daughter suitor comes up and says that he wants to be an entrepreneur uh, because the best entrepreneurs, Hiram Perk and Sequoia, those who were who were professionals uh, in that game, um, are going to lose lose me and not have a big home run 89 percent of the time. So, Portfolios can turn to be one. So, if you go into the entrepreneurial world, especially, you're gonna you're gonna fail a bunch of times. I have some material on how to mitigate that in this presentation at the end, and how to think about that. So I haven't solved it, but I thought about it a lot. So I would say, uh, you know, for for uh, the internet professional services opportunity we undertook, we made a bet. The bet was that this was just when, you, if you remember. You may, some of you may remember, older folks will remember. When the internet was coming out, sites were actually crashing. There was so many, there was so much concurrent use and so much traffic that uh, the thought that we had in that business was you're going to need a lot of complex integration in the back end in order to scale these sites. That bet turned out to be not exactly right as components were built and scalability became less of a custom high ticket challenge. Uh, and something that was more manageable in-house. It was hard to predict, even though you can see it in hindsight, that the internet bubble was just going to absolutely uh, burst so rapidly so that the client base that we had in the Wobstone example was going to disappear pretty rapidly. But that's an example where we went in 
uh, you know, with the best of intentions, and the market fell out a little bit from under us. And there's probably some questions of could we have managed that better. I wasn't at the top top of the company, but I was managing our our Boston office. And uh, you'll you will unless you and even if, if you are in a large company, by the way, I'll go through some data in a second. You're going to experience some of those failures, and. Uh, I think Silicon Valley is populated with networks of people who came from failures that then created successes. If you look at Next, which is, and, and the iOS itself, uh, Apple took some of the assets of a quote-unquote failed company and they formed the core of its renaissance, really. And a lot of the employees that Steve Jobs brought over are, are hailed with some of the visionaries in the next generation. And so it's a vision of being as smart as you can, managing risk intelligently, and then when you when you get hit and you're down, you pop back up. And you will get hit. And you will be down. And you will pop back up. Uh, any other questions on career before we jump to this bill? Yes? Um, How's your name? Spencer Bailey. Spencer Bailey? Matt, you said that you're trying to surround yourself with individuals that are smarter than you. Yeah. You kind of build these networks around you. Can you give us some advice on you know, networking with others and being able to continue to bump into them later in careers and how that will yeah. Drive this forward. So uh, you need some moxie, Spencer. The question was, how do you how do you form these networks over time? And the answer is uh, actually it's twofold. One is you're you're going to want to get out and and have some intestinal fortitude. So in this in the law firm example, before we got funding, I would go to a Harvard Business School classroom like this. I would go to lunch and learn. And one thing I found is that very senior people are less intimidated by people with backpacks. I could, it, I, could, I could walk up to almost any famous person with a backpack on saying I was a student, and they'd be like, sure. <laughs> Steve Jobs talks about this with, uh, with uh, either Hewlett or Packer, is a 12-year-old just calling him in the phone book and ordering, saying, yeah, I've got this project, and he says, sure, I'm be happy to help out. So I went uh, in one of the evening, one, uh, evening learning sessions extremely dimly lit, not as well lit as this. I just sat up there. Jeff Taylor, who had just started the Monster Board, uh, which was monster.com, if you've heard of the recruiting agency, was giving a talk, and I walked down to him and said, hey, I have some buddies that can do custom programming, some smart MIT guys, do you need some work? He said, yeah, here's my card. And from that started my summer, and from that started the Lava Storm opportunity uh, for me after I, I went to Medtronic and came back. So I, I think uh, one is you've got to You've got to have a plan. You've got to be out there, even though you don't feel like, hey, yeah, I know anybody. You need, you need people to keep in contact. The other thing is reputations. I had a business partner who said reputations are built over decades. It can be destroyed in minutes. And it's very important over time. I'm amazed by how little, especially in this connected age, you can learn from your past. There are so many people that knows so many people. If someone wanted to learn about Matt Irig, you would have a ton of people in Boston and every place you worked for them to say, should I do business with this person? Do you think this person would make a, could make a contribution in this kind of a role? And you have to be pretty consistent over time, and you'll fail sometimes, but maintaining the respect of that community and the way that you handle yourself, your confidence, your effort circles that you're that you're in is very important over time and, and hard to break. And I, I dwell on that for a moment at this time in your careers because you can do something about it. You can do something about it. I remember I had a professor at, at HBS who just said, you know, you know, ladies and gentlemen, it's not kid time anymore. You're now you're now adults. And you know, everything that you do and, and the way that you act and your performance is 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 on the record, and uh, and consequences are different than when than when you came from a high school environment or even a college environment in this case, undergrad environment. So guard guard that. It's not a brand because I don't think you're marketing yourself, but but guard who you are and the way you conduct yourself in business, and then the reputational the reputational come. Uh, but but that's a very important part of networking. Uh, the, the people approach you and, and want to work with you based on more than just your desire to approach.
approach that. And uh, you'll see that with your faculty, your dean, the other people that, that you'll watch through their careers. Uh, you'll be all over the place and say, hey, you, I, I was at this school, and, and people, people will see, will think better of you because of that. So that's a good question. Any, any uh, other questions? Yes. We better go. We better, we only got a half hour to learn how to build businesses. So I think we can do it. Yes. Hi, Robinson. It's my name. Tyler. Uh, how do you analyze risk and recognize when you should stop a venture or whether you should fight through it? Mm -hmm. Very good questions. Tyler's question was, how do you rack and stack risk and how do you know when you give up? So hold that thought, Tyler. I'm going to answer that on slide number uh, 18, 19, and 20. Okay, so here was our first slide. We better get, we better get moving. Uh, let's talk about building new businesses. And I, we can't talk about uh, everything related to organic growth is, is, is not going to be discussable in 30 minutes. But I'll give a shot at, at distilling some lessons, and again, I'll tell some stories from my own experience. So here, here's part of the reason why you're going to be switching jobs. So there was a lot of analysis done. This is one set that we did at Insight. Uh, Dick Foster, who was a very senior guy at McKinsey, and ran the private equity practice and was on our board, ran analysis of the, has run analysis of the S&P 500, the largest market, the firms with the largest market capitalizations over time, and looked at the churn on that list. There's other measures, like if we look at the Forbes 100 in 1917, those that still exist, in the, and those on the Fortune 100 for how large companies are. Here's just two truths in the world, and it's quite fascinating. Uh, if, there's, if I was to live another life, I'd go be a PhD and study stuff like this. But uh, if you were on, if you were on the S&P 500 in the 60s or 70s, uh, 60s, the early maybe the early part of that scale, you'd likely be on that list up to several decades. So, so firms, big firms, stayed on the list. The churn of the largest firms in America was was fairly low, even in, you know, three, four, five uh, decades ago. Uh, we ran analysis before I left that I think showed that 75% of that list is going to be churned off in 15 years. Okay. So the amount of disruptive innovation and firms coming on and off uh, and the business models being destroyed, it, it's, it's what uh, Schumpeter called creative destruction. Uh, for those of you who are into some of the original works. Uh, and you see that here. Firms don't, don't last. They get gobbled up, they go bankrupt, so 134. And, and those that, that do survive over long periods of time, don't, they underperform, they don't do well. So uh, religious institutions, governments, uh, educational institutions last hundreds of years, businesses don't. Businesses are not built to last, that is a lie. That is an empirical lie. Businesses are built to fail. And we will talk about why in just a second. Um, you heard it. <laughs> it sounds good, but, but there are forces at work that make it very, very difficult over multiple decades to outperform the market. Uh, just that's what the data shows. Now we, we, we struggle and we try and we consult so that, so that we can buck the trend. But those are the facts. Here's the chart of disruptive innovation. I'm going to go through this quickly. How many of you have seen it? Anyone ever seen? The, uh, yes, we've got a few. Uh, so please do not fall asleep. I will not show many charts here. This is one of them. This is a very important chart. Uh, there are, how do I say this? Of, of the business academics that, that use rigorous methodology that would, that would stand up uh, to, to rigorous social science or natural science, Scrutiny. I, I would say Clay and only a few others are, are on that list. So this is well thought out reasoning about how firms, why firms fail over time, and and, and how you might seize opportunity in that in that failure, understanding that failure. So there's, this is performance and time. This is the most famous chart of disruptive innovation. I'll just show one. So. What happens over time is that, is that an average customer, so there are, are very demanding customers, 
there are customers that aren't that demanding. But the average customer's needs have this gentle slope over time. There's always in every industry power users. So if you think about um, processing power, there are those of you who would be gamers or who would build huge regression models late at night for your classes. I will remind you getting graphics that are huge power users, but for the majority of users, they have this curve. And what happens is the pace of technological process, this is say processing speed, chip speed, exceeds what an average consumer can use over time. That, and and, and these, these leaps can happen, and little leaps or big leaps forward, we always call them sustained innovations. If it's helping a core customer do better, what they were trying to do in the past, we call that sustaining. So when people use disruptive innovation, they say it's a big breakthrough. That's uh, telling them that's the wrong way to use it. Uh, incumbents win these battles. Disruptive companies come in below the performance curve of the average consumer. So as, as the incumbents are overshooting, and uh, you know one of the original uh, projects that Clay Christensen worked on was the Celeron. So as, as chip power was increasing over time, Intel came out with a, a chip that wasn't as powerful, but has other benefits. And the benefits can be it's cheaper. The benefits can be the technology is just easier to use or enables new markets. No matter what type it is, it's a disruption. It's worse than the, than the core technology. The incumbents look at it and they say, margins are terrible on this. The market's not very big. We are set up to innovate on this path. This is what quality means. So they ignore what's going on here. And then the disruptor comes in, gets better and better, moves up over time, and eats into this core market. That is the theory of disruptive innovation in, in 30 seconds. It's all over the place. And the reason Clay gained some notoriety for this is that he began seeing it everywhere. Schools are a really interesting example of this, and I, I think my brother's written a little bit about this, which is just the notion that the largest growing schools in the world are not brick and mortar. <coughs> are not brick and mortar schools. It's like Concord Law School or other online courses that provide a not as good of an experience as you might get, uh, but it's more customized, it's more flexible, it allows people to, to get into the market that couldn't have time. Uh, they can, again, they can afford it. So a big market is built here and then over time these markets move up. Almost every great stock you, wanted, you would have wanted to invest in starts down here, and you never see it. So when eBay first comes out and say, should I buy that stock? Well, wait a second. It's Pez dispensers and, and you know, chiclets and comic books. This is not, but what people don't see is, yeah, they're going to be auctioning Ferraris and, and fine art as, as you move up into that market. So the incumbents ignore it. Their processes and resources can't deal with it. They don't like the size of the market and the margin structure. So that's disruptive innovation, and that's a prime driver of this sort of churn that you see. Salesforce.com is it as it's gotten into the market. Amazon online retailing. It provides a suboptimal experience at first. Maybe it's limited, limited selection, but it gets a foothold in a market, and it offers performance trade-offs that customers are willing to adopt and then it moves up. Got it? So how do you avoid that, and how do you take advantage of it? One of the things about, about Vivint is that in the world of home automation, all that we've been able to, to buy up to this point uh, are systems like Crestron, if you're a big rock star, if you're Jay-Z or whoever owns these things for $100,000, you can have your pool cover, your lights, everything put in the system, but the market's quite inaccessible, right? Because huge money up front, you can control four, 10, 15, 20,000 bucks, You've got to have a specialized person come in and spend a lot of time. You can't reprogram it yourself. So one of the things about Vivint that attracted me is we're disrupting a bunch of industries. So we went from security and said, hey, we can, we can embed some intelligence so that we can not just look at door locks and we can not just look at sensors, but we can also look at energy management here at home and manage that centrally. We can have no money up front. Uh, an RMR recurring monthly revenue model so that a, lar a much larger portion of the market could afford it. Solar is, si uh, solar is similar for a bit. Uh, it used to be you know, buying solar installation was 40,000 bucks, 30,000 bucks up front. So only the rich, rich could afford it. And we've offered power purchase agreements so that there's uh, 
you, you pay no, no money for the system and you pay a, a monthly recurring fee that's 20% less than your current power bill. So again, the innovation is sometimes in the technology, but more often in the entire business model that you put on it, it creates new markets, offers customers the ability to get into a market and consume something they couldn't, or offers a price performance trade-off that they like to take. So one of the one of the big things that you all look to in your career is can I get involved in disruptive opportunities that are gonna likely have this big growth trajectory? And uh, that's one of the things that I looked at with Vivint is it was a platform, you know, we did have sales and installation and service, these things that we were well known for. But the bigger thought was, gosh, we can get into a lot of disruptive businesses where we can have sensors that are pulling data into a central, into a central source and making autonomous or semi-autonomous decisions that are going to lower costs in, in folks' lives with things like power and uh, provide geo-tracking and a lot of other services for, uh, for individuals and families. I, I run the Innovation Center. Uh, in, in innovation, you know, this is overused word that probably, I don't know if it would go out of favor or not, uh, but we actually build real stuff there, so if you come visit us, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, it's an R&D center, basically, where we build the software, the hardware, and the embedded software in that hardware, and, uh, and build these next generation verticals. And this is sort of a holding tank for those. We use a process that I'm, that I'm going to explain in a second for the last few minutes uh, that, that will help you if you're in established businesses, sustaining businesses, or if you're building disruptive businesses, so pay attention. Uh, here's just three. You can, you can create boxes that say anything. <laughs> so you've know, been through like 10 years, and, and Dean Anderson has done this as a consulting company, right? So you're like, can we split that box into five boxes? So <laughs> looking for the four cell major. Right, and, and, and you know what? There's not a lot of science in PowerPoint boxes. <laughs> so we, we are just going to be simple. It's, 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 it's Occam's razor, which are all in favor of. So we are, we are going to talk about an early phase where we come up with a customer value proposition and a business model. We are going to talk about testing. There was a great question that I'm holding from the second row about how do we deal with risks. And they're scaling. And you've heard of this lean startup stuff, uh, which was popularized on the West Coast, but some of it was originated on the East Coast. And so we'll talk about it. Okay, so this is a terrible chart for the presentation to look at it. Incomprehensible, a lot of words. But this, this is what I just wanted to say. If you look at these three Roman numerals, in this early stage we talked about, this, this circle represents what a business model is. And you ought to learn what a business model is and how it works. There's two, there's a couple of good books, Seizing the White Space by my partner Mark Johnson is a good book just to learn about business models. And especially if you're in a corporation and you're bogged down, you want to say, you, you're saying to yourself, I'm just an assistant product manager in the cubes, but we have to change this business model, forget. It's a good book to read. Seizing the White Space by Mark Johnson. If you're an entrepreneur, uh, there is a, uh, a business model mapping book by Alexander Osterwilder, uh, who, who uh, got his PhD in, in strategy, and I think in business models specifically. Uh, that's, that he introduces a concept uh, called the business model canvas that also can be useful. Uh, but you're modeling the solution here in the middle. So there's a customer value proposition. This is what are we offering customers and what do they need. There's resources and processes, which is how are we going to deliver that value. And, a and at what cost? And a profit system, which basically says what's the model in which we, we make money. So. What our revenue, our overhead, what is the asset turnover? And these three things work in concert. So the first thing we're going to do, we always, always, always never forget this. I mean, the, the number one failure mode in large companies is a product orientation. You become a product manager, and your job is to evolve your product. And that is, that is patently false. Your, your job is to provide customer value of which a set of integrated products and services are a part. And so I want to talk about having a customer, not product, focus first. A little bit about modeling a solution, and then we'll answer this question at the end, which is, 
when we are when we are doing in a lean startup environment, even a large company, how do we think about that and how do we model risk? You ready? So what is the job to be done? And I'm going to go through this quickly so that you, so that you see it. But a job, the job view of the world is people don't want your drill, they want the hole. And there's a great article for those of you who are fixing out, it's called uh, of, of, of Business History and, and Academic Thought, Marketing Myopia by Ted Lovett, who was around at Harvard Business School decades ago, which is a best-selling article that talks about something called industry definition. And you know, one of the things that comes out of that article is people don't care about your product. They're hiring your product to get something done in their lives. They don't want your drill, they want the hole. They could, they could get the hole through many ways. They could punch one themselves with an article. They could buy a, a board with a hole in it. So, and I think uh, Professor Levitt's article talks about uh, definition, I think he uses the transportation industry, he talks about trains but, and trucks, but it's, it's this notion that you don't care about your solution, you want to get a job to be done, and they are hiring your product to do a job in their life, and you don't ask, what are you trying to do, you ask, why are you trying to get that done? And you don't get fixated on, oh, here's a solution, 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 how can my product uh, meet your needs? You're, you're asking, and you learn about the five whys, but you, you ask about, why are you doing that? And you try to observe folks so that you can figure out what job they're trying to get done. Let me, let me go through these quickly. Um, the first one is just an example from India. Ratan Tata built this one lakh car, uh, which is a couple thousand bucks. And, and you look at the car and people said, well, that's not a car. I mean, that's just a, a little motor with some metal around it. But he said, no, the job to be done is not buy a luxurious car. It's for the people who can't consume cars, get me off my scooter. If I'm in a presentation, I always know how it's going because the job of there's an old BlackBerry, but the job of a BlackBerry iPhone is not is it is still small snippets of time. If you're boring people, you're <laughs> that baby's going to come right out. Right? So, quick, quick, Scott, quick said, and we were good friends with him at Insight. But he said, "Look, the job to be done in a small business is not accounting. No offense to any of you professors or um, Hudson's College or whatever here, but people don't want to do accounting generally." They want to not to account. The job to be done is help me not to run a debit from a credit and make sure I don't run out of money. And so the insight was how can I make it simple, not how do I approach it from a product perspective out. Does that make sense? Never forget that. It's very, very important. I think of all the concepts, even more than instructive innovation, the notion of identifying customer jobs and integrating around that solution is an important one. Let me talk quickly about an example from India. You'll see now from this career thing, I sort of wove in, any chance I get, I'm getting off to the third world. There's a lot of issues there. I mean, we're, we're happy here in, in Cash Valley, but uh, if you're in West Bengal and Calcutta, uh, you know, we've got some, there's some big issues in the world that business leaders, I use that word intentionally, can really help solve the business model innovation. I hope you guys do. Here's one consulting project we have in Godridge, which is a conglomerate, a light goods manufacturer. They make um, actually hair dyes and locks and a lot of things. But here's their original refrigerator. And the challenge was, in one of these workshops, how can we create a, a refrigerator for the masses? And the usual strategy of US corporations is sort of a, uh, a, a shrink, take the same business model and shrink it. So let's do that right now. Here's the refrigerator, this is a cheap refrigerator, and move it right in there. It's kind of it. It's like, hey, for Coke, let's put a local name on this thing. Or, you know, we're one of the, you know, Unilever, let's, let's make little sachets and, and we'll customize the local environment. But it's, it's not much of a rethink of the business model. And so it doesn't work. So with, with Godridge, we asked the question, not what product we should make initially, but what is the job to be done of the folks in, in the middle of the pyramid? 400 bucks a month. Uh, and, and down. And, and really, they don't need a full function refrigerator. They're not storing, you know, bluebell ice cream for, you know, Friday night. If you, if you went and observed, and this is one of the things that's very important, not just quant research, but observe it, you'll see, what do you see in there? I want to keep water cold. Unbearably hot, and I want to keep drinks cold, and I want to store some leftovers so they don't spoil. So I can eat them. Very simple observation. They're communal refrigerators. The power is out a lot in their environment, and so you need to operate maybe on a car battery as other means. 
So here is the product that we helped this company. I'm not with, was, was, I wish I had one here because they're really cool. I had one in my office. Uh, they do work. Um, in fact, they have three should drink sometimes. They work as well. But this is a Chota <laughs> pool. Uh, pool. This is a local villager. Um, we created it first of all on top. It's a, you can see the two fans and the, and the lid is sort of this uh, smile. It's a it's candy red, which the these groups got together and, uh, and came up with that. But this is a good where you can say, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a consumption good that I can show my neighbors and, and, uh, and be proud of. It opens from the top, and so all of the coldness stays there in the bottom. It's got a semiconductor chip that uses the Peltier effect. Uh, just as, as, the, as the currents go in opposite directions, it's going to cool much like if you plug a USB in your, in your car or truck and have one of those little coolers. So a semiconductor cooling chip. Uh, it's, it's inexpensive, $70. Uh, it can work on uh, a variety of power sources, so if the power's out, you can, you can use it that way again. If it's off for a while, it settles down. It's sold in a local village model, home to home, again, as an object of uh, consumption that your neighbors or others would want. And it's done very well over time. But again, it's a product that's designed from the jobs, uh, from the jobs in, not the product out, which is how we strip down a refrigerator and get a cheap refrigerator to a developing market that they'll be able to afford. So it's just an example, uh, one example, and here's, uh, here's winning the India's Innovative Company of the Year Award, here's the CEO. So that was something that wasn't a huge project for us, but something I was very proud of personally, uh, both in the intellectual the process that went into it and in the result. Here's another more common example. We worked on the Chevy Malibu launch. We didn't work on creating the car itself, but in, in, in marketing it to end consumers using the Jobs to be Done methodology. Here's just three types of jobs, social, emotional, and functional. Think about the clothes you wear, the products you use. There's a functional reason why you're wearing clothes, uh, and the functional reason is you've got to cover yourself up. You've got to stay warm. There is an uh, emotional reason, which is how I feel about myself. How do I feel uh, wearing what I do? I think of that as a product. Uh, there is a social reason you dress the way you do. Why do I look like this? Why does everybody look the way they do? Because I'm telling, I'm telling you something about me and who I am. So jobs have social, emotional, and functional elements. And they change depending on the circumstance. The car that you buy as a, a middle-aged father for yourself in a midlife crisis is not going to be the same as the car you're going to buy for your girl going off to college as a freshman, right? So the circumstance determines those jobs. Here was just a little, this was a great project in that you almost never consult and have PowerPoint go directly into, into a uh, environment where it's used. But we made, it wasn't this exact slide, but criteria for the sales folks to come in to say, type customers by jobs. Who are they? What type of customer? Is this a customer that is a, a commuter job that wants to enhance the commute? We should get functional GPS cup holder or other things and emphasize those aspects of the product. Is it going to be bought in a family purchase where we emphasize safety as a job? Is it social, which is convey my status? And you can sell different benefits, even with the product that's already made, depending on what the jobs can be done on. Uh, let me talk about let me actually just talk about this for 30 seconds. Uh, another case study near and dear to my heart, which is uh, medical devices, this is an industry I've worked in, where uh, they're paid in the US and in other countries on a reimbursed basis for extremely uh, expensive. So think about just pacemakers and defibrillators. Many times these are life-saving devices that are easy to be aware of here in the US, meaning a doctor is gonna you're going to know that you have a condition that you need to go in for. They're easy to be diagnosed on a care pathway, and they're reimbursed. So it's not going to cost you anything. That doesn't exist in many parts of the world. The vast majority, the majority of the world's population, billions and billions of consumers, uh, are not under systems that they can be aware and be diagnosed, go through a referral care pathway, and receive a product. They're going to die. They, they're going to die because there's no business model innovation. So you, 
look at the work that you guys are doing, and, and this is the kind of stuff where you say to yourself, that's not right. We can't figure out a business model to get products to even the middle of the pyramid of India, hundreds of millions of people. If you're making $400 a month for everything and supporting a family, and you have a condition that needs a device that's even several thousand dollars, uh, you're, you're going to suffer and in some cases die because uh, there's nothing available for you. So one of the challenges, and I had worked at a company called Medtronic, as I said, and I was a consultant again. And I went in the second time, they had a very enlightened uh, CEO, Omar Ishraq from GE, who, who is Indian, and the challenge was how do we create growth and profitable growth, not giving stuff away, but how do we create a real business model that attacks the middle of the pyramid? I'll just skip through here uh, to the end. This is a picture um, of a billboard. That's a real billboard, actually, in West Bengal, Calcutta. Um, of a direct marketing campaign that we created to make folks aware if they have symptoms, if they have syncope and they're fainting, shortness of breath, other things, to call the line and get education. We then had telemedicine centers that we set up that would diagnose patients, and you'd have somebody reading the ECG in, in, uh, in a centralized city in Mumbai, a doctor getting back, getting those folks referred to a hospital setting, and then providing the first consumer financing program for devices to make them affordable um, and on a self-pay basis outside of the US. So, this was the first patient, and it was a very magical moment uh, seeing her and hearing her say, you know, without this program, you know, I might not be alive and I wouldn't have had this, this care. And it's the kind of power, I think, of business and innovation and business model innovation. This program is now in 70 hospitals and has served thousands and thousands of patients. This guy is uh, an Ashoka uh, fellow, uh, David Green, who is the founder of Aura Lab. Uh, and we took a lot of the learnings from Aravind, which got cataract care to the third world. And we, we did some analogous work trying to uh, apply that to medical devices. Your question. There's a Harvard Business School article uh, that, that uh, Mark Gilbert and I co-wrote on measuring risk in new ventures. So if we if we run out of time here, you can. Uh, it may be good for insomnia <laughs> if you are tired. You can read that article, but you you might find it at some point in your careers interesting. It rests on just this simple concept, and so I'll answer your question right now, which is uh, risks are often not classified and ordered and taken off the table uh, correctly in new ventures, and that's a key cause of failure. So that's the, the summary of the article. So we have three types of risks in, in the order that we should go after them. What usually happens is you go after stuff that's easy or for which data is available first. Often it's very time consuming, and then you have a deal killer risk that's hidden in your venture a little bit below. So, Risk and value are inversely proportional. For those of you going to the venture capital world, and you take risk off the table, and uh, as you take risk off the table, value is going to increase. You want to take the most important risk off first to get the biggest kick in the increase in value, right? So oftentimes, if you have a bunch of risk, risk development of website, warehousing cables, environment, inventory consignment, customer demand, operations, product mix, it may turn out that the deal killer risk, this risk number four, is, is buried. And there's another risk, the product mix, which is path dependent, which means depending on how this risk is resolved, the, uh, the venture could turn in completely in one direction or another. You want to bend the curve. If you, if you then reorder these risks, you're creating much more value up front. And so in, in response to your question, you're going to want to order the risks in the correct way, and then you're going to want to. Oops. Oh, this is bad. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, so here's one more important chart. In a, in a, fixed, in, in a strategy in most corporations, if you're going to launch a new line of toothpaste, have, have any of you built sort of uh, discounted cash flow models? And so you've built a, a model of a, of a product launch before. And in most launches in established companies, let's say that you're in P&G and you're launching a new uh, type of Crest toothpaste, um, it's going to be new Sparkle, Purple Sparkle. You're going to know most of the most of the assumptions you're making in that spreadsheet are going to be knowns with only a few unknowns. That ratio, knowns to unknowns, is very important. In sustaining ventures, the known to unknown ratio is very, very high. It's flipped for other types of ventures. So whereas, if this represents the winning strategy in the end, all of the elements and the assumptions you're making about where, what distribution should happen, pricing, which customers do we target, uh, and many others, if these represent, if this represents the right strategy along those elements, when you're launching a known product or a derivation of a known product, you know most of the things. You can invest $100 million, you know how a consumer is going to respond, you know how the channel operates, you know how to reach them, you know about how much it's going to cost, and you can have a delivered strategy straight out to this point. The problem is, in world-changing innovations, a lot of the things you're going to be working on, it, it's mostly unknowns. You don't know, you, the only things you know, the answer is not in the conference room. And data doesn't exist. Data can't be analyzed for markets that don't exist. You guys are going to be creating markets that don't exist, right? And so what do you do in that case? What you do in that case is you order the risk correctly. You build a reverse income statement. A woman named Rita McGrath. If you search Rita McGrath, you'll get a great article in the Harvard Business Review on uh, on a reverse income statement where you say, how much profit do we have to make from this? Let's not go through the charade of, of making some numbers, having something pop out. And when my manager says number not high enough, I do goal seek in the spreadsheet. I spreadsheet and I crank my numbers up. Let's say it has to be this big, and then let me get all of the assumptions that build to that number. Let me order them and let me test them. And then to your question, you're going to move to this one. You're going to you're going to move the most important risk first. And then you're often, you know, the, the research that's been done at, at Harvard talks about you're going to change your business model four or five times. So you're going to move here, you're going to find out that the assumptions are wrong, and then you're going to pivot your, you're going to pivot your model. When you know that you're dead, you'll occasionally hit deal killing risk that you couldn't see. And it could be technology, and that's a good example where you just say, it's not going to work. And so, so risk, so the experiments need to be time limited. And then they need to be limited in the amount of money you spend. The mantra should be invest a little work, learn a lot, fail fast, fail cheap. And that is a mentality that is completely opposed to the mentality that we'll see in most corporations. And, and really, that's what we do. And I think Vivid is great at that because we have this field support that we can get into. So if I say, what does the take rate need to be on this new internet? Uh, and what would the take rate need to be, and what is it? I can send folks out and immediately get data a few hours later. So, and that's that's a lot of this. As you, as you hear about design thinking, a lot of that is jobs to be on customer centric. You think about lean startup, it's very much uh, along these lines. I I think I've held you for a little bit long, Dean, and, and that's right. I just wanted to thank you all for the chance to speak on. Thank you. Schools. We're out at, uh, at Harvard, Harvard College, Stanford, uh, Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Brigham Young University, Utah State, and we are uh, we have a summer program called the Summer Fellows Program. You know why it's called the Summer Fellows Program? It sounds better than the summer thing. <laughs> and uh, and we've had a lot of interest in it. We ran about. Uh, 15 folks through it last summer, and we we have uh, we we have uh, we signed in the mentors, most of whom are sort of Ivy League 
graduate types have been consulted in other places, assigned their project, and actually built really well business. Uh, we did the training for a couple of days, but more end up here, and then we have seminars each week on how to get into the top business school, how to model, um, and then we, we have a very nice dinner and a nice event at my house. How did they get into the social? So you, you Connor, and uh, yeah. this is Connor. You talk to Connor. <laughs> and then we'll do interviews coming this fall. But, uh, and then we have full-time positions. We're, just, we're, we're looking for all the best and brightest around the country, and so we're so grateful to be in front of the group. So could Connor stand out in the aisle, in the, in the aisles out there? Connor will stand. <laughs> 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 